Super guys, um, welcome to um, a very wet and horrible July evening in the UK, um, talking about all things Manchelling with Spaniels. I'll introduce myself quickly and then Jolie will introduce herself and then we will crack on talking about Spaniels. Um, I'm just going to load up the PowerPoint because it's got a little bit of what we need on it. I will go silent because the stupid thing always mutes me. Okay, this is where you go. Can you can you all see my screen? <laughs> Super. I can't see the comments, Jolene. So if anything pops up, just uh, let me know. Can you see the yeah. PowerPoint? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Super. So you all know why you're here. Talk about Spaniels. Um, me and Jolene. That's a lovely photo of me and Captain My Springer Spaniel. Um, I actually read him for. Well, I read him for detection work during lockdown, but. Uh, that never happened so we uh, ended up doing man trailing and he's a stonking dog but like most people with springer spaniels at trail or any spaniels at trail um he's fast as lightning gives me absolutely nothing to read on the trail because he goes so fast and then attempts to take me on the any cut corner he can and through a bush over a tree no care for me um he's extremely good at it he's just very hard to trail um and I've just actually gone, oh, this isn't hard enough. I'll buy another Springer. So I've, I've got an 11 week old Springer puppy who is more Malligator than Spaniel. I've never had such a switched on bitey puppy. <laughs> um, and I love it a bit, but um, she's, I can already tell now she's going to teach me quite a bit about man trailing Spaniels because she's tenacious and very independent. So she's going to be good fun. Jolene, do you want to introduce your two? So I managed to stick mine down to one spot um, to get a picture. So that's myself and River is the liver and white spaniel and Reef is my uh, black and white sprocker. So um, they're not very old, River's three um, and she was trailing for about two years now, but she's very sassy. So a lot of the things we talk about is a lot of the stuff that I'm getting on the trails with her. Um, so not going too fast and that's very negatives uh hunting crittering you name it that dog puts me through it um and then reef is just a completely different kettle of fish he's only been i haven't had him long uh he's only two i've had him about a year and a bit now um and he's been trailing since the start just because he was a complete jerk and i wanted him to sleep so um yeah but he's actually he's really good he's really on trail he's like he's just we were saying the other day he's a really honest dog so he's either on it or off it which makes it really easy he's just very fast and very strong so that's my team um i've been trailing for about four or five years now and an instructor for about three um so yeah i've come from the shepherds and then decided to get a spaniel because i thought it'd be easier i think a lot of people come to spaniels they think it's easier and it's a dirty great lie whoever's spreading it is a liar yeah um, but yeah, so interestingly, we've got three, obviously four spans between us now, but they all trail very differently. Um, and Reef is a really interesting dog to trail with, I think, because he is extremely honest and he doesn't get off the trail unless he's completely lost it. So he's he's a cool spaniel to trail. Um, so we are going to talk tonight. We're going to try and again keep it. It's, it's not going to be an hour, guys. It'll be an hour worth of content, but it'll be like quarter past um, eight by the time we're finished. Um, just talk quickly about the division of the subbreeds of spaniel. Um, not every spaniel is the same, they are very different. Um, we've got increased popularity and in where we believe that's going to come from. Crittering versus hunting um, on the trail, which are pretty look the same with spaniels, which is where a lot of problems come from. People are like, oh, the dog's around the corner and there's somebody there. And it's no, the, the dog has switched to a squirrel. Um, setting up for success, we're all here to learn a bit more about setting up for success for our spaniels. Um, and starting with success, you You've got there's the things to start in before you're trailing um, that make a big difference. Um, we ran our first Spaniel and their crosses workshop a couple of months ago and we had fantastic success. It was really nice to see um, the students get it and we broke down some of the theory for them. So they've really got an understanding of how their Spaniel and Spaniel crosses worked. Um, and we saw a lot of improvement on that workshop um and hopefully people went home and said it was good well they all rebooked again so they must have thought it was at least uh, worth some money um Claire's just said best day ever oh thanks claire yeah. um, her spaniel is rock solid he's so cool to watch trail as well he's bang on <laughs> 
Um, and we, we've kind of seen an increase in popularity in the breed within man trailing. Um, I think one of the reasons people think is uh, they're easier. Um, I don't know where it's come from, but um, they're smaller and they're full of fun. So I think people go, oh, they're small and they're energetic and they like to use a nose and they're really good drugs dogs. So spaniels would be great. And they are the best and the worst dogs to trail. I always say to people, um, you'll you'll love it at the start because the dog will absolutely fly you through everything. And then it starts to get a bit more thinky and then you're screwed as a handler because <laughs> you have to hold on tight. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Jolene, that they think that it's going to be easy with a spaniel. Um, yeah, I just think I think a lot of for, for us, obviously, we're doing it as a sport. I think a lot of people are getting spaniels because they're great pet dogs, but then they're finding that they need to do something with them. Um, so that can be sort of the issue is that they're needing to give them um, a job or an, an outlet for all this energy um, and making them think. Um, so that's what we found. But then obviously going through and looking at how to read them, like they take off really well and they seem to get the game really quickly, but then it can get complicated quite quickly as well. So once the dog's so many sessions in and we have to start asking the handler to start reading them and to tell us what they think it is, are they on it, are they off, etc. Um, handlers can then struggle and it's just purely because a lot of the behaviour is very similar. Um, so yeah, that's what I would sort of go with for that. Absolutely. Um... We critting versus hunting. I think a lot of people falsely interpret these things. They go, oh, the dog switched to squirrels when actually they're looking for the trail or vice versa, because we'll, we'll talk about more in a minute. But I think a lot of spaniels will show the same behavior because it's the same emotional release for them. It's the same like, oh, my God, there's something here. Oh, my God, there might be something here. Um, and it's that crazy, like giddy belly language where, you know, something is going on because suddenly they've got the energy is completely changing them. You just don't know whether they found the person or they've picked up the trail of a deer and you're about to die going through a bush. Um, and that's a difficult thing to read, um, but it's something we're going to talk about tonight and hopefully we can help you kind of see it from both sides. Um, and yeah, also looking at setting up the trails for success as well, because I think a lot of the time we sort of just go on and sort of you're reliant on your instructor um, doing your progressional plan and things like that. So we want to look at setting the dogs up for success and sort of starting with success as well. So we want to look at, are these dogs that we need to be setting up trails where we encourage those negative decisions or those decision points with them so that we can get them to work more effectively on things like junctions or open areas. Um, if you've worked your Spaniel and you've done it for a while, you'll see that we, you get some Spaniels that are really great and they'll be really true to trail. And then after a while you'll go through and you'll get to a junction and last time they chose the junction really well and but now today they want to check every possible junction just to make sure um, and you'll find that that sometimes happens that the dogs become more methodical sometimes or sometimes they just go yeah because we're going so fast we'll just go down here and give it a go and then they go oh actually we've gone the wrong way um, so we want to look at setting the trails up for success and it's something that me and Catherine have been talking about is if these dogs are consistently going into a hunt mode, because that's what they've been bred to do, and that's what we'll talk about a bit more later, are these dogs that we have to encourage negative behaviours? So we have to encourage the dogs to tell us where there's no trail um, so that they can then sort of get that into their head because it's nothing for them to just go, well, we'll keep trying down here, we'll keep trying down here. Yeah, they're shitty teenagers, aren't they? And the Spaniels will go all day long. We've all seen it like, oh, I can't tell my spaniel out. I spend the ball for three hours and it's still going and and things. And it's 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 that behavior. It's that kind of mentality. The dog just goes and goes and goes is why they can be quite difficult to read man training because you don't know where they lost the trail. They just goes and goes and goes. So, yeah, it's uh, it can be hard. But that's what we're it's about this webinar tonight, guys, and uh, our spaniel days. Let's talk spaniel breeds, guys. Um, <laughs> Amy will recognize the uh, lovely Hendrix, um, a lovely working cocker um so we want to talk tonight just about four well three subbreeds and a, a later breed that we're encountering with spaniels at least 30 percent of spaniels we work with may have poodle in them um you know we've we've been very lucky to work with quite a few different types of spaniels um in the uk but obviously springers and cockers are the most popular probably closely followed by poodles as a gun dog breed. And then Columbus Spaniels are picking up um, 
interest in man trailing we've been lucky enough to work with a few now and uh, we had one on our spaniel specific day i know we've got one on our next one um so it'd be good but um the cockles and springers have always been popular in the uk and they were obviously the same breed at one point and then they split off and springers became larger um and used for going over the brush and cockers became smaller for going under the brush and then you get cockers that are like hendrix here who's what some people would deem oversized he's not he's the size a cocker should be um and springers are a lot smaller now than they should be they, they should be quite a bit bigger than they are um so there's lots of change in the breed but really when it comes down to it um springers i think spring by name spring by nature they tend to have absolutely no self-preservation and will launch off anything um and will you know use their height they like to jump they like to get on stuff they like to really check out environments and they can switch to visual quite a bit um when they're using the elevation um huge popular pets hugely popular as gun dogs and detection dogs um and they're very versatile i find that um the springers seem to be what people seem as an all more, more all-rounder um but i can be absolutely um told off from that one if there's something more to it cockers uh, bread for hunting woodcock all day um and they're much smaller um i find them incredibly tenacious because they're bred to go a bit more under the brush i find that they're very like i will keep working i keep working i keep working even to their own detriment they will work for exhaustion and they will push through things so much that they won't they'll forget they've got a handler <laughs> and suddenly disappear under a bush and you're like well i'm not going with you the spaniel's going why are you coming with me you fool um and then obviously you get kind of a cross between springers and cockers and sprockers, which is what Reef is. But interesting, Reef doesn't really act like either dog. He acts like Reef, and he's quite in, he's quite in, individual, <laughs> isn't he, Julie? Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, and then we get the cross of the two. Even though they're similarly bred dogs, the genetics aren't that far away from each other. You do get the breed will switch. You, genetics kicks in, and you'll get that kind of they're more springery today, they're more cockery today. Um, Spani the the um the cockers like to use their nose um and i don't find that they switch to um eyesight so much because they are used for just going through brush and brush and brush the bird flies up and brush 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 the bird flies up they're not looking for it whereas springers can be re more reused as retrieving sometimes i can be proven wrong on that one um and they tend to be a little more visual um the very the springers like to flush so the springers will show a yeah. bit of a chase and then they want to flush something mm. but it's like a quick elevation so once something's been flushed this like the springers like oh okay Whereas yeah, the the cockers, aren't they? yeah the cockers tend to be sort of they're hunting for something to pick up mm. something and bring it back now obviously we've bred these dogs now to do like to multitask in the gun dog world um, and yeah. so this is also where sort of genetics plays a part as well because obviously we often refer to a lot of working dogs um, because that's what we have, but we see a lot of pet dogs all the time. So when we refer to sort of like really high drive and things like that, you might have a Springer or a Cocker that's really nice and sort of really dainty and trails really sweetly and calm and like makes all the decisions really nicely and stuff. Like if you do, I will buy that dog off you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's... Um, but yeah, like it's just looking at what the dogs uh, were originally bred to do and then looking at how that will affect how their body language is perceived on the trail. Um, so Catherine was right, like the springers can be quite visual. So if they see something, they will often take you off trail to find out what it was. And they can be quite visual with movement. So if a bird suddenly goes or something like that, um, I get that a lot with River. She's like, if a bird goes, I'm done. Um, mm. And I have to just watch what I'm doing with her. But the cockers, yeah, they seem to be a lot truer to scent, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, that's what I found with them. They tend to be more on it and they're very tenacious. But again, if they lose the trail, they're that busy working. They won't tell you. Nothing's changed by an hour. You're just like, yep, they might be sent here. They might be sent here. And they'll just plow on for two or 300 metres. Um, what you've got is also is clumbers. So clumbers were the, the gentleman's shooting dog. Um, they're very bright, very intelligent. They've got tenacity, but they have a steadiness to them. And I really enjoy working with the clumbers because they're like, yep, the trail's over here, guys. It's this way. I'm going to go a bit of speed, guys, if you want to hold on. But they won't try and kill you. Um, and they're, they're very 
gentle, but they like to carry stuff. So the ones a lot we work with on the way back, they love their reward. They have to carry something. They're like, oh, I found you and I stole your thing. And I'm so happy with myself. Um, and you have to, you know, look at them and go, you are a Spaniel, but you're not um, 400 miles per hour Spaniel. Um, so it's, they're, they're quite nice to work with, but we're seeing a popularity increase with those in the UK. I think people get them and they're, they don't want to do gun dog work with them, but they want to do something with them. And man trailing fits them really well because it's something fun um, and it's relatively low impact on them as well. The one thing I've spotted with the, sorry Catherine, the one things I've spotted with the the clumbers is that they can actually be quite reserved and aloof. Mm. Um, So they're not, they're not all ways big for going up to strangers, which can often cause an issue on trails. Um, So that's always one to sort of be looking at. So like they're lovely dogs and they can be quite affectionate, but they're not as, would I say sociable? They're not, I mean, some Spaniels want to be at the jumpers, don't they? They tend to be a bit over the top. I think clumbers are like, yep, yeah, part of the gang. Yeah, just quite reserved and quite, like the ones I've seen, and I could be wrong, there's obviously going to be differences in them, but um, yeah, just quite reserved and they can be quite aloof, whereas like Springers and Cockers are quite, can be quite in your face, can't they? Unless you've got a real timid one or stuff. Yeah, not all, there. but the majority tend to be at the jumper a bit and knock a trail layer over and be a bit keen. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about poodles. Poodles are not spaniels, um, but we are being so interbred with them now. And there's so many mixes out there that it would be daft not to talk about poodles briefly when you talk about spaniels, because we have cockapoos, cavapoos, um, sproodles, you name it, it's crossed the poodle, which is fantastic because poodles, are, you know, they're really bright dogs. Um, and they are also gun dog. They're a water retrieved dog. They're used to going in water retrieving um, ducks and things. And we also have obviously three versions that we have a standard, a miniature and a toy. And each of those have their own personality. I find the standard to be either very aloof or um, very friendly. It's kind of no in between. Um, but it doesn't matter whether there's to- standard miniature or toy. They are incredibly good at reading human body language. They are they would pick up everything, which is why, you know, cockapoo became um, really popular as uh, like therapy dogs, because they're very, very switched on to it. Um, they're highly trainable, but they will train you before you train them absolutely every time. Um, and they want to work. So when we're crossing these poodles into spaniels, what we're creating is a bit more thinky fast dogs. Um, and some of them are, are, are really into man training, really want to do it. Some of them are a bit more like, well, I would like get stuck in a bush, God forbid. Um, we have one that Charles does. I don't think she's on the webinar tonight. He's a lovely dog, but if there's any sort of prickle, he will not go in any of the trail layer and he will sit as far away as possible and go, well, you can get out of the bush, love. Um, and that handler's actually just got a working cocker to do man- that's a rescue's man trailing and it's like chalk and cheese. <laughs> they might both be cocker spaniels in there, but um, one is not like the other. So yeah, the, the poodle is popular and it's worth, if you've got a poodle cross, kind of finding out if you've got a standard a toy or a miniature in there because a toy and miniature do have different personalities. I'm not so hot on their genetics, but I um, it is worth kind of looking into them a bit more and um, thinking about you haven't just got a dog bred for one specific dog. You've got a dog that has conflict in its brain. It's going to want to retrieve and it's very per people orientated and then you've got the spaniel side that's like yeah i've got to work busy 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 and sometimes actually it can cause a bit of conflict because the dog doesn't know whether to go to trail layer or go on the critter or go to the handler and then you get this little ball of chaos that doesn't really know what to do with itself because it's just wanting to do something successfully um so it's always worth noting when you've got crossbreeds and then when you look at that as well you can have a look at sort of where your um sort of like where your breed of dog has kind of come from like their breeder their lines that kind of thing here over start please um because if you get a springer or a cocker with lots of field trials in it and especially the poodles as well as well they're like Catherine said they train their humans really well which will also make them sort of handler sensitive and handler savvy they will read you on trails as <laughs> everybody's dog's gone off it's right we can't okay. hear you they will read you on trails and they will work but also keep an eye on the handler and you can actually just really influence the dogs um quite easily without noticing him but so it's quite good to sort of have a look if you can obviously if it's a rescue dog you can't but knowing the breed and knowing what 
that breed's meant to do and then having a look at sort of what we've just gone through now to try and help you figure out the body language on the trail yeah definitely right critting versus hunting versus potential proximity um do you want to take the lead on this jolene and i'll jump in yeah this is uh something very passionate to me um so when we're having a look at crittering and when we're talking about crittering we're on about switching scent um so not just switching scent from human to human but switching onto an animal and that could be whatever animal floats your spaniel's boat um so birds rabbits um partridge pheas pheasant whatever is going to capture that dog's attention and make it switch is what we class as crittering Hunting is then when the dog is searching for the trail or switching scents, um, scent even. Um, so we want to be looking at and sort of trying to help you identify the differences in these. Um, and there will be slight differences, um, but that's what the whole thing about tonight is going through. And then also we want to look at proximity behaviour. So when we're looking at proximity and what we're talking about there is we're talking about the dog getting close to the trail layer or the runner or the misper, what you choose to call them. Um, when the dog chooses to hit the bulk amount of that person's scent, like their scent plume, uh, they can then go into a proximity behaviour so they can get over exaggerated, more excited because they know that their trail layer is close um, and their reward is close. So that is the proximity behaviour and that's what we're going to be looking at as well. Yeah, and I think the reason why um, they all look the same is because the, the the excitement's the same for the spaniel, finding a person, finding a bird, searching for the person, searching for a bird, drugs or otherwise. It's all the same emotion and you get this like, little buzz and it's very hard to know the difference be between them. Um, your dog River is a good example of it because it used to be when she switched to Critter, she was like, she'd go real buzzy and you could read it a mile off now she's subtle and all changes is her tail because she's she's conflicted about what to do sometimes, isn't she? Um, yeah. And her behaviour's changed recently as, as her, her man trailing journey has developed. Yeah, we're um, having a, a complete fallout at the moment. We're not friends. So, not friend. And I'm, I'm happy to say that because like as a handler, as a, a pet dog sport person that does man trailing as an instructor like we go out and we trail um and I probably trail as much as you guys do like I am having these issues on my trails and that's part of the reasons why we got together I'd be ringing Catherine or sending her a voice note going that bloody dog blah 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 um and it's just we all go through it irrespective of who we are because we are tapping into your spaniels natural instincts and that's why they love the game so much we are tapping into their natural instincts and then saying no actually we don't want you to go after x y or z that you love we're going to give it to a straight the, the the your reward to a stranger and we want you to have the same love and value for it um so yes they love it but then obviously we can get these this conflict sometimes with the spaniels where they go oh do i actually love it that much um and just looking at it from that point of view but we wanted to depict um having a look um because like we said like the drive to search for them is there as is the reward that you give them providing you've got the right reward for your dog but sometimes there's just like that sense just more thrilling more enticing for them yeah and i think some of that comes from history isn't it if you've got a dog that's been a serial bird chaser or rabbit killer or chase deer if you get somewhere there's a person in the bush that they may or may not like and a rabbit i can tell you now that dog's going to switch to the rabbit because the reward history is higher um and even if that dog has never caught a rabbit its brain is so excited about the fact it might catch one today might be the day to get the rabbit um and that's why they keep hunting for it when trail layer yes they get 100 percent success rate but there isn't the same thrill as finding a rabbit um, on the same chase because they're restricted to a lead or they're restricted to um, having to really work for it, not just chase off to having to really put their brain and get in. They're like, well, the rabbit I might not get, but it's going to be good fun. Whereas a person I'm definitely going to get, but also I know I'll back in the car afterwards too. Um, 
I see a lot of that dogs will switch to crittering or hunting behavior even when they're near the person because they'll go oh I don't know where they are I'm going to go look in the bush over here to prolong the opportunity to hunt and and trail and do stuff because they're down well they're going to go back in the car and that's when you really need to look at what is motivating your spaniel um because I can guarantee you the reward is not right with that um you've got to really find something and um, I'm, I really enjoy playing with my dog after man trailing. I don't want to just feed a food chuck in the car. I want to play tuggy with my spaniel. Anybody that has seen my spaniel trail um, or trail layered for him knows that you've got to watch your fingers because he comes in, gives you a beautiful indication and then snatches that toy out of your hand <laughs> um, and then wants you to play tuggy with him because that's his reward. His, his favourite thing in the world is to disembowel toys and kill stuff. Well, OK, can you play tuggy, though? Not disembowel a rabbit on the walk, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, so trying to switch that into something that's productive, but also noticing the difference um, with it all. The crittering hunting proximity may look the same, but they have and they have the same motivation behind them. But the dog's end goal is different. And you need to tap into that end goal with them. Um, that's not the rabbit. It's not looking for the person. It's finding the person. And those are three different things. Um, I hope you agree with that, Jolene, because I went on a bit of a rant about something then. <laughs> <laughs> went off on reward, rewards. Maybe that's the next I was about to go on about playing with toys, and I thought, no, stop yourself. This is not <laughs> now enough. <laughs> that's I another think, one. <laughs> yeah, I think often we need to look at as well, sort of, like you said, the rewards are real key. Um, but looking at what your dog does outside. So, like, for me, I allow River to chase a lot of stuff it just happens I'm a dog walker she's out she's off lead I need her to have a recall I don't really care what she does after that because I am walking other people's dogs does that make sense like I'm a yeah. bit I've probably been a bit la lazy as an owner with her but as long as she's got a recall I'm happy for her to sort of mooch around and do what she wants so she hunts like every day to her heart's content and that just drives her and that piques her um but then when I ask her to do it for um, man trailing she's the she's the one that will go it's too she'll give me a head pop she'll be like it's over there but we're going to go here and we're going to check it out because I don't want it to finish yet or I've switched crittering um and for a long time it was really frustrating but there will be those cues that are there and we'll we'll crack on through it and talk about sort of the predatory sequence um for them and how it's probably going to be different um predatory sequence for the spaniels don't know if you want to do that Catherine yeah so for those that most people have heard of it but you might have heard it in the terms that we're going to talk about it is um predatory sequence is broken down into it's, it's based on dogs and wolves and kind of the survival instinct but it's they spot the track they orient towards the prey they've heard it they smelt it they eyeball it they may see it they stalk it they chase it there's a grab bite grab kill the set consume and within man trailing we are supposed to be tapping into the um chase and consume part of it now different breeds have this broken down collies have you know the real eye stalk as part of the genetics we've selected over thousands of years hounds are very much about the chase um terriers do the the grab kill <laughs> um in the sect spaniels can be quite the sexy as well but the the thing is as we've you know worked with breeds and we've selected breeds over the past whatever thousand years this natural hunt prey kill thing that's come from kind of like wolves and more um feral dogs and and more realistic things that are surviving without us um spaniels i don't think necessarily have half of this predator sequence or if they do have it they don't have it in the way we would expect it to so if you think about a spaniel they have grab bite because they have to retrieve that's fine and they have chase they don't really have a dissect. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, someone's more than welcome to say, oh, it's bullshit, Catherine, or, you know, but they, some will, you know, dissect stuff because you kind of get, they kind of get the habit of it, but they don't naturally go, I want to consume the thing at the end. They go, I found this thing. I got to carry this thing. It's now my thing. Nobody could have this thing. And they, that kind of been twisted into like a guarding or like a, a I need to carry things rather than I need to consume it um, or dissect it, which is why, again, this is going to be a little reward rant, is why food isn't always the best thing for a spaniel when you're rewarding it. 
because if you think about what they're bred to do, which is go and get the bird and retrieve it to you, go and do something and get a reward from you, or there is so much reward in the action. You don't need to give that dog a treat after it's retrieved the, the pheasant. It just wants to bloody retrieve it. So when it finds a person, it goes, yeah, I found the person. I can't retrieve them <laughs> or I can't hunt again. There's, there's no again with it. So um, when you look at the predatory sequence, spaniels don't really fit in it very well now. Um, and we have to really think about, yes, they use their nose to find somebody, but if they were just a gun dog, they would be tasked again and again and again and again, which makes them really tenacious at the job, but they don't like going back in the car sometimes because they're like, but I want to go 10,000 times more. They also get to the person and go, thanks for the food, but I'm not so fussed about that because I was loving the chase. So, you know, I use a toy with my Springer. I'm using my puppy. I'm teaching her. I, I want to really, I'll use a bit of food, but I want to use toys with her for man trailing because I want her to have a party at the end. I want her to play toggy with me. I want to play toggy with Charlie. I want her to be able to throw the toy into the bush and she goes, such as for the toy so that the fun doesn't stop when she finds the trail there. The next thing begins and the next thing begins. It's not just an intensity trail like we use within Man Trailing Global. It's an intensity trail plus a party, plus a fine, plus the most excitement thing in the world. So the high doesn't end for her and it doesn't end for my Springer now. And that's an adjustment I've made for my Spaniels. You might be thinking about your Spaniel going, yeah, actually, is he likes food, but would he prefer if I scattered the food? So maybe I should use big chunks of treat and, and work like that. Um, but the predatory sequence that orient, eye, stalk, chase, grab, bite, grab, kill, the set, consume. I think spaniels only do grab, bite and chase. I don't think they really do the other ones so much. I think so, basically if we're looking at the predatory sequence, yes. um, we'd be looking at sort of which is stronger. So probably orient and eye because they're quite visual, aren't they, a lot of the time chase um they probably shouldn't be chasing as much because once they put a bird up that's it stopped so i was if you look back sort of years ago they probably weren't like hunting they would but chasing they shouldn't have been done doing a lot of but now we're seeing a lot of chasing we're seeing a lot of dogs that want to chase birds and things yeah, um, I think that's, it's, it's misplaced genetics yeah isn't it? and then i think if you were looking at a spaniel as well like River doesn't really like she'll eat, but I don't think she would want to eat. Does, so the consume part for me doesn't work. Does that make sense? And Reef definitely. Reef's taking the food because it's there, not really because it's like he's enjoying it, but he'd probably like, yeah, okay. Like the consume part's always sort of looked odd for me because my spaniels generally get to the end and their pupils are dilated, which means that they're out of their tiny little brains so they can't like she can't do anything so she wouldn't want to play she wouldn't want it really eat so for me the consume part doesn't do much and then you've got the spaniels that like to get something can parade around so there's those spaniels like they want to show you stuff they want to tell you that they've got stuff they don't really are those the dogs that want to be having food no they'd probably just like to be sort of showing you that they've got a ball or showing you that they've got a rabbit toy and they want to just go around and telling everyone that they've done a fab job um and this is what they've got so for me i don't know for spaniels if parade should be in there as well because yeah parade i mean that is a, a really good word i think and i like that and it, it's important to know your spaniel as well the things that they enjoy doing at home do they actually enjoy you throwing the ball 40 times or is it the ball throwing bit they enjoy or is it the bit with you when you come back and you go, oh, such a good dog and they go, I know, I'm so good. You know, which bit is it they actually enjoy? What what makes your spaniel tick? Because until you know what makes your spaniel tick, your reward's always going to be a little bit subpar. Um, it's a really, that's, it feels like a really mean statement, but it's, it's not meant that way. Um, and if you don't have the right reward, your dog is going to switch to crittering. They are going to potentially switch sense when they're hunting for the trail they're, they're going to not want to find that reward when there's with the trail area rather when there's other potential rewards in the environment um and what we need you need to do as handlers and what we do as instructors and and as people that live with spaniels for their stupidity of life um because they're like yeah let's get another one um <laughs> i've got three so i'm not saying anything don't um, start i'll have a you can have reef what do you mean you don't you wanted my puppy the other day so i said i'd have her 
Yeah, I'm not doing a hot roof though. <laughs> um, reef's a play thing. My puppy adores reef, and poor reef's like, oh hello, you're back, are you? And she's like, yeah, they're back. Come right out. Yeah. Um, so poor yeah. reef. Um, so what we want to look at doing for you guys is we want to help you learn the different body language um, and changes along the trail because we've kind of gone off a little bit on um, sorry talking about it's the right reward, but I think that. Like I said, we could probably talk more just about the predatory sequence because what I like to do is I quite like asking questions that I don't I have a, an idea of the answer, but it's always good to gain knowledge and perspective from other people. So even though we're instructors, everyone that we train with and everyone, every dog that we see, we're learning from it as well. And that's the whole purpose of why we're doing these webinars. So we're learning as we're going along with you um, and we can we can will help sort of as a community together um so that it's all sort of big one thing so I like to always sort of be I'd love to sort of dissect them and be sort of like well what is a negative what do you think is a negative what do you think your your dog's predatory sequence would be that type of stuff and maybe we could probably do it a, a sort of an, a version of this but with people's questions and yeah. just have like a chat yeah. um and just get different people's opinions on it so want to have a look at casting because yeah, casting is a big one with spaniels so casting for us is uh where the dog loses the trail um i'll describe the body language quickly um just so that you're sort of familiar with it if you're not familiar with the phrase so casting might be when your dog was going in sort of a straight line or following the trail and then all of a sudden you get that loop round would be how I would describe it. All of a sudden there's a change in behavior and we get sort of a loops or a lot of loops or we get a lot of sort of like lunging. I don't know if anyone can see me. I can only see Catherine. Um, oh, and I'm, let, me, let me stop sharing. And we I was just looking it. at myself because I'm doing a lot of hand signals. Face. I'm like, actually, no one can see me. <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, there we go. So yeah, is everyone familiar with the term casting? on uh, pinned up now so we can all see you <laughs> so yeah um so yeah it's yeah. just literally sort of looking at when the dog could potentially be off the trail um we did think sort of where they'd lost it and you might have been too far in but i've been working quite um a lot with a lot of spaniels lately um just to get my eye in on the behavior um and it was I've found it a lot as well when you're looking at different areas. So open areas or big junctions, big open junction areas, whether it be flatland, urban, tarmac, whatever, you will get a lot of casting in those areas purely because of scent movement. Um, so that would be, for me, I always look at body language and changes. I'm not specifically looking for a negative and on trail and off trail. I'm just looking for a change. Because then if I note a change, I can then look at potentially why that ch that change has happened and monitor the dog. So instead of me doing a junction with my dog and looking for the dog to go down and give me a negative, I'm looking for the dog heading into that junction and potentially any changes before that dog's even thrown me that negative. So when we're talking about a negative, it's when the dog runs out of scent or there's no scent there and it will either come back on itself or change direction. Does that make sense? Is everyone still yeah. awake? <laughs> a lot of naughty faces. It's a... yeah. We haven't bored everyone yet. So with the, the casting stuff, you'll find that you'll sort of be on a sort of your trail. You'll feel quite steady often. You'll feel like, yes, I'm actually on this. Then all of a sudden you might get a load of loops, a load of loops or a load of sort of wide swinging back and forth. Um, and then that would be for me, actually, my dog's off the trail now. And you want to be looking at sort of the dog trying to figure out its direction. I think often when we go down our journey and we get sort of further in our man trailing careers, I'm going to say, with our dogs, um, our man trailing fun, our man trailing sessions, um, it can often be just because we're putting sort of harder, more complex stuff in. Um, and it's, it's usually where the dog's just struggling to get the scent. So some of the dogs that I see really struggle and it, 
it could be blowy conditions, whatever. And we'll get absolutely loads of casting around until the dog picks up the trail again. But that's when like the handler needs to sort of recognize the area that they're in and try and help the dog as a team. So a lot of the time we look about sort of how the dog takes the lead and we don't want to help the dog um, or influence the dog. But if your dog is doing a lot of this casting in an area and we believe that they're off trail, we want to be looking at where we came into that trail. So where did we come in? Where did my dog's body language change? And where did that cast start? And then we'd be looking at sort of potentially if it's a massive junction area, we did it yesterday and it was probably about 20 meters. So the person stood to one side and was allowing the dog to cast. And I was like, okay, so if you cast it around this area here, I, mean, I can only show your hands. If you cast it here, but it's all over here and your dog can't get there on the line, you need to move so your dog can cast here to potentially refine the trail um, and to go out. So I think sometimes we often just get into um, a bit of an issue of sort of a lot of spaniels as well because they can be quite circular like I know some in particular that once they can't get to where they want to go they just spin um so the casting can be quite an issue for them so it's often as well with the fast dogs the fast dogs will often cast quite a bit um with these conditions and go forward um but then after a while once they've casted you want to sort of if you helped or not helped and we can obviously look at that when, if you're going to come and train with us um you want to be looking at the dog sort of picking up the scent again and then if you've done it before you've probably all seen it they do a cast they finally catch the trail again and then you back out and you're back into that trailing behavior does that make sense do you agree with that mm, i'm definitely. quite a visual person and i'm struggling because i've only got my hands i look like what um, might be good, we yeah. might we'll do it at some point, guys, is we will put a compilation video together and we will talk over the top of just some spaniels trailing. The reason that videos are crap in Zoom is you will only see it at the resolution your internet will allow. So I could put a high resolution video up, but you'll just see pixels. So it's a bit of an awkward one on Zoom. Um, but yeah, we could do something like that to talk about it. And then we'll get less of Jolene's arm waving and more. Um, <laughs> something <laughs> more fun. constructive. <laughs> Yeah, it might be a little bit easier for you guys to understand, but you've all been there. If you've got a spaniel, you've got a spaniel cross, or you've worked with any spaniel dogs, you've all been at that juncture where the dog's just gone, bah! and you're going, I think they're trailing. Um, and it's, yeah, it is a hard thing. You're a horse all of a sudden. Yeah, and uh, you should go on a tree at this point, and you're trying to get them untangled, and then they try to go again, and you're getting really frustrated and checking them by accident, and your instructor's going, no, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. You're like, a spaniel's crazy. <laughs> Why have I done this to myself? <laughs> Stupid. Yeah. I'm going to buy a Labrador. Um, uh, it's super. Right. Um, Is there any questions on casting? Mm, yeah. Uh, Claire's Cantel's put, we did an off trail start a few weeks ago where Gerald had to cast to find the beginning of the trail. He found it really challenging, but so pleased with himself. Yeah. Casting starts or display starts is as I know, a really good fun and they're a great test for Spaniels because, um, they go the, but there's no start and they look at you and go what are you on about and um some some stop immediately and don't start and they need a bit of help other dogs go right i'll start looking for the trail casting like a freaking lunatic um and it's hard to actually get to start on the trail because they're so busy looking for it and nose down and they're working and working and they got themselves in such a tiz that there's no immediate start that by the time they have hit the trail they're like <gasps> I'm going to die if I don't find them. And their bloody dopamine, their brain's gone ballistic and their adrenaline's gone high. And they're not always thinking by that point. Uh, you do find you need to get about 10 metres down the trail and suddenly they come down and touch. And when I did it with Captain, he just sat next to me and went, there's no trail here. And I was like, do you want to look for it? And he went, yeah, OK. And he found it and was fine. But it's the first time that he's never just tried to kill me at the start of a trail. Because normally he just takes off like the clappers and no, no care about me. But and this was the only time he just went, there's no trail here. Shit, what do I do? And it wasn't an SI, it wasn't a no scent. He just went, I don't know which way you want me to go. Um, obviously there was air scent coming across. So it was quite interesting with that one. Um, Lisa Marie's confirmed the video chat would be good. Yeah, me and Julian will sit down one day and talk man Spaniel man trailing on a video. Um, we've got loads of videos of our dogs doing stupid things, so that's fine. <laughs> 
Um, super. Any you don't more... want to show those ones. I will show the Captain Death Trail because it's the one that makes me go, don't trust your Spaniel. Um, never trust your Spaniel. Um, super, should we, I'm not going to put the PowerPoint back up because we can read off our, our notes, but um, known trails, um, Spaniel owners and instructors do it back, so we all do it. Um, oh, Catch just asked, is the casting start a more experienced handler thing? Yes, you need a dog yeah. that's common and you need to be able to really read your dog because if you get the casting start wrong so casting in this context there are two casting start i call it display start but it's also known as casting start is where you stand here trail layer's gone left the sent article you do not start anywhere near where that trail layer has left from um the sent article is usually thrown i tend to throw it as far as i can lob a sent article away from the trail um and the dog's got to start it's got to do a cast in order to find the trail um it really throws some dogs if you don't do it right it's a good learning opportunity it's an extremely good way of reading your dog but if your dog is not super confident and doesn't understand the game you will have to walk it to the start and all you do is create a reliance on you and you're not the dog's confidence because it goes i don't understand what you want from me because you can't explain it to a dog so it's it's something very very careful to do um to be careful with it and i've not seen anybody do it in too early I, it's something i do on like fun days or like we'll do it on spaniel days as a spaniel type thing to test but um yeah i can't just place start because i sent articles displaced because there is another casting start called the casting exercise which is um different completely different again does does a similar thing but it is different um, and that's part of the cocker method um so yeah it's definitely not something to rush into that's for sure because if your dog's learned that a trail it obviously has an exit point by the scent article then you're bringing it up and all of a sudden there's no trail there like it's kind of like an nsi um as in there's no scent from that at all so it's definitely not something i would look to rush into with my dog because i want to my dog to be looking and i'm happy to take off does that make sense if you put sometimes too much pressure on a dog at the start and we'll talk about it in a bit um it can really make it hard your dog can sort of really struggle to then take off and enjoy the game um and we can we often see that as well that sort of switching from delayed starts where the the dog still sees the handler uh, the trail layer go to then a scent article start with some dogs can be really difficult because of the vision's there the orient the eye the stalk the chase that's all there but now all of a sudden it's gone and it but it, for the dog it still needs to have the same representation and it still needs to have the same reward so it, it definitely the casting start i wouldn't rush into it um just because you want to be able to make sure that your dog's confident enough to just be like, yeah, that's fine. I'll just have a look for it. As opposed to just sit by your leg and go, I don't know what you want from me. Um, does that make sense, Kat? Yeah. The, the thing is, is I'm like the type of trailer that I'm very careful of what I introduce to dogs and stuff like I haven't done I've done a casting start with River but ha I've not done a casting start with Reef because with some dogs I'm wondering if you would accidentally create more of a need to hunt so I'm a little bit cautious of what instincts my dog has and how it shows me how it trails because I wouldn't want to put more hunting does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Like not Absolutely. at the moment, like I will, but obviously not at the moment. I want us to be really rock solid and to be good as a team. And then I'd start putting like harder starts in and stuff. And that leads beautifully into working with known trails. Because there's no point going up single blind or double blind for a spaniel. You can't bloody read them. Um, we do it by accident because Spaniels are really good at it and you usually are just like, yeah, let's do this and let's have fun. And you, you're an adrenaline junkie like your bloody Spaniel because if you've got Spaniels, you've got to be slightly got to screw loose. Um, you've, got to, you've got to not be quite right. So you're usually adrenaline junkie because you like the high energy of the dogs, you like the buzz. So you want to do harder, faster, stronger. And we can skip foundation super easy because the dogs can do it. And they can do it when your instructor's telling you where the trail is, but the second you have no coaching, suddenly everything falls apart and it immediately falls on its ass. And I've seen so many teams like, yeah, 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 yeah. You start to go, okay, I'm not going to help you. Um, and they usually come to me from other instructors and they're just <laughs> plateaued like shit because 
the dogs either pick up on sort of body language of the handler because again we've got really bright animals and we are setting them up for success but what we're not doing is learning what our dog's body language on the trail is and off the trail is we're just pulling them off junctions because that's not the right way to go that's not a decision of dogs that's handler interference so when there's no handler interference suddenly these dogs go 200 meters in the wrong direction um so it's working on known trails known as blue line trails within Mantrail and global but they are known trails you know the trail has gone, the trail has gone up here, turn right at that junction. So when you hit that junction, you don't go, right, OK, trail goes this way and walk into the right hand side. You hit the junction and you let your dog work so you can read the body language. The dog might go immediately right, go with them. The dog might go, oh, I don't know, and check every junction. That junction might be going 20 metres, 30 metres down that junction. They get so far down, I go, oh, there's no trail here. And the behaviour you see is maybe a slow down. You might even see them speed up all of a sudden because it's tipping into that hunting. Oh, lost the trail. Shit, 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 shit. Something will change. You will see a behaviour that is a change in that dog. And that might be increase or decrease of pressure on the line. That might be um, suddenly looking more. They might put the nose down. You might hear them really snuffling, looking for the trail. That's all completely individual to that dog. There are breed more breed specific traits that may appear, but that's very individual to the dog. So Captain My Spring used to go down and he used to ghost and he would just keep hunting until I learned to read him better. He now weirdly crabs up the trail. So he trails on a diagonal now, like a nutter. Um, and then when he's lost the trail, he gets so strong, he will drag me in a bush. Now, it used to be when he was dragging, he was on the trail. And when he slowed down, he'd lost the trail. Now he's decided beautifully in the last three months to completely change what he does and throw me for a curveball. Just when I'm thinking about doing my level two, um, because something's changed in how he must. Something's must have changed in how he's processing scent. Um, I also think he's got a little bit of bad back, which is where the crabbing's come from a tiny bit. I need to get him seen. I think there's a little bit. I've noticed a little patch of fluff on his back. Um, but so, yeah, he, he trailed a diagonal. Quite nice, quite nice. When he's lost it, he's got the clappers. If I didn't know that dog, if I didn't know where those trails changed, I would assume he's either crittering, which he isn't because he's not he's he doesn't often switch critter on a trail or he was in proximity and he's not he's going shit i've lost the trail and he's hunting for it um and he'll go about 20 meters now then usually go stop give me a pee if he gives me a second pee i know damn well but there's no trail down there and come shooting past me at 90 miles an hour usually giving me a small amount of whiplash and then checks the next junction <laughs> this all can happen in about five seconds sometimes because he's that fast he's gone down the junction he's back up the junction he's made a decision and he's gone he wouldn't be able to make those decisions if i hadn't done hundreds and hundreds of known trails with him so i know where the trail stopped and without trying to influence so we all influence back some but without influencing letting him check all those junctions letting him learn how to check junctions and not just cast like a complete lunatic and suddenly pick a direction um and it takes time and it hundreds of known trails um with him before i felt confident to do loads more single blinds and obviously aiming up for this double blind now um and working with instructors that are setting me up trails that work you know the winds coming in the right direction and things like that um if you don't know where the trail is you cannot help your dog get back on it and i you it's all right the instructor saying oh we we lost we turned he missed a junction 20 meters ago well you weren't able to look 20 meters ago and what changed you you can't go shit did he did he lose tension did he not lose tension did he did he look in the bush did he what because quite often that's what why me and jolene both advocate for it film every bloody trail you do and look back at the videos because that's where you'll learn the most but if you can go okay i know he's gonna have trail now i'm just gonna really really watch his behavior that, that's what i've seen it bang i've seen it um so today I was doing a um, actually a consult with an instructor um, about her dog's trailing over Zoom. And we noticed on a video playback that when her dog's lost a trail, it keeps its nose down, but it does really wide sniffs, like a, like a flow negative. It's not a flow negative. It's a really wide sniff. It's a shepherd. When it's on the trail, it does very, very small sniffs. It is a difference of probably half a foot is all the differences. But I suddenly went, bang, that's where the dog lost the trail. Did you see the change? in his body language if we hadn't looked back at that video um wouldn't have noticed it yet but eventually noticed it but wouldn't have noticed it yet so it's really important that you know where those turns are you know where the trail's gone and you've got 
an ability to kind of really analytically think about your your dog and those trails and you can't do that without knowing where those trails are sorry it's super like so claire's just put um in the comments you know when to look for the super quick head tilt and nods when you do junctions on an old known trail as well so like yeah. if you know that you've come into a five-way junction and the person's gone left you can just almost stand back and observe what your dog is doing and just let it work and then obviously if it does pick the wrong junction just go with it like we're not saying stop it we're not saying because you know where the trail goes don't let it go a different way you want to go wherever the spaniel chooses to go because that is the body language you're looking for does that make sense so if we always stay on the trail we'll never know the body language that we're looking for so we almost have to set trails up so that we encourage those decision points so you'd want to be looking at setting trails up that encourage you to do work junctions and if you do it known like i said you know it's gone left or right so then you just watch what your dog does it puts the pressure off you as a handler and a, as a team and it just allows you to observe what that dog does and like claire said it could just be a quick head tilt so rivers is just a look she looks and goes yeah the trail's there but I'm going to go back this way and we're just going to pick up speed and then I'm going to go into a bit of a stalker pose and then when I know that I'm really off trail my tail goes really down because I know now I'm being naughty and I'm not following my trail does that make sense so Rivers is like and then when she's hunting her ears go up like Princess Leah so the muscles on the top of her head change and her ears prick so that she looks like she's got two buns on the top of her head because remember when we're looking at body language we're looking from the bum so we want to be looking and observing what changes from the bum end because it's really easy if i was to take pictures of everyone's dogs on here while they were trailing i could pinpoint from the pictures what we're looking for so you're looking for head height you're looking for the tail you're looking for the carriage you want to be looking at the gate does the dog speed up does the dog slow down so you want to be making a note of all these things while you're train trailing. But for me, it's like, I can't process all that while I'm on a trail. I'm going to be honest. Like if I'm going at supersonic speed with a 20 kilo sprocker trying to avoid a tree, I'm just going to spot a change. And then me, I look at the surroundings and I go, ah, oh, okay, so I'm at a junction. Ah, oh, okay, there's a little rabbit hole there or oh okay there was a little pathway there that she didn't check but she gave me a head nod so if you do those known trails you can almost just relax a little bit I know that we all want to progress and we all want to do super well and it's there's nothing better than the bond you get when you do an awesome single blind trail like when you and your dog works as a team and you find that trail layer and your dog's done it, you've not had to help, there's not been any passive help, your dog's been super confident, you've been like top notch as a handler, you haven't got in the way, you haven't obstructed, and you get there, like you feel that euphoria, like I felt it, it's the whole reason why I trail, like that euphoria when you two are a team at the end of that line is absolutely amazing, but sometimes I think we become like adrenaline junkies, like we need it, we need that. I need to have that feeling all the time whereas we should be looking at like a, a learning experience so for me it's just all learning and the the issue with any dog that trails once they get more proficient in doing it the body language could change hence why we're saying just look for a change mm -hmm. like if we work out that your dog's tail wags sort of quite slow when it's on or fast when it's off or whatever way around it is if we do some trails and we put more drive in or the reward gets better the body language could change and then we're like oh actually the tail's not moving like it should i did a trail the other week with river a trail didn't a tail didn't wag at all and that was one of my go-to body language like river's tail when she's on animals would be super fast and supersonic when she's on human scent it's like an indicator tick tock tick tock when she's gone past it and i haven't registered it it tucks under so it goes still she didn't give me anything on the whole of the trail like it was just tucked and i was like uh okay we'll go with this but so for me like it's just cool to just sit back and watch those videos um and just check because you can see 
and we always just need to see what's happening from the bum end and yep. go from there. Definitely. Um, watch the butt. Yes. Um, I think the other thing to add to no known trails is um, something spaniel owners will be told multiple times a session. Slow down. I know they're fast. Believe me. Me and Jolie know is they're fast. Is that Tony fast. smiling? Yeah, better be. <laughs> yes. um, because you're not doing your dog any favour by speeding up. You, you're certainly not doing you any favour by speeding up. Um, and you need to go your pace. You need to sustain that pace. And that dog, yeah, I'm not talking about going to snow pace. You know, you're going to be walking a fast walk um, because no one's going to just saunter behind a spaniel unless it's broke, completely broken. I've got two legs and one eye and doesn't know where it is. Um, it, they always go fast. And the more you pick up speed, the faster they're going to get, the more they're going to blow junctions, the more the adrenaline is pumping and they just become mentalists they're just off the tits um and i know it's hard work because they are four-wheel drive and they take your certain gravity down but if your dog is a maximum of 25 kilos and you are a 60 to 75 kilo person at, at, you know kind of least you can hold the fucking dog like you can hold it i don't i uh, too strong for me then get a chihuahua um no you can do it um it, you've got to find a way that works for you now some people that's put the line behind them some people that's keeping their hands low other people it's a line a, a line length feels more comfortable to them you've got to try and error it don't get stuck in a rut and think oh i've got to pick up speed even if you say to instructor, you know what could we double line the dog for a little while can we can you help me hold the dog's weight so that we can slow it down and if the dog can learn it doesn't need to go at 90 miles an hour or it also learns it can't jerk me around corners because don't don't be stupid they they're not thick um they do know what they can and can't get you to do so there's lots of you know one of my ones is, is double lining with spines helps and two just um just getting the dog to you putting a bit more weight in it and slowing down See, we've gone over an hour now, Jolie, and people are leaving. They're bored. I know. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully they're not bored and they just have to go. It's a good job we're recording it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> they got a life. Yeah. So um, with the slow down, speed working as a team. So it's okay for the dog to learn to slow with you. Lisa Marie said that. So for me, the way I've had to do it is I've had to sort of find a common ground. Because obviously at the start, we want the dogs to... Um, succeed we want them to enjoy the game but inevitably can you match that spaniel speed over a, a long period you so why start off at that speed also if your spaniel's going that quick it's just going to peak its adrenaline anyway so when it's peaked its adrenaline and it's hyper is it going to be making decisions properly and appropriately is it going to switch more to hunting because it's made those decisions and it's like well i actually like like reef would run all day every day at 60 miles an hour if you can could that's his feel good thing he doesn't even have to be running after anything he just runs for the sake of it so he's just peaking his own adrenaline so for him on a trail if i get him to go too quick he's just sky high so in that state of mind he's not making sort of good decisions he's not making good choices so when i always teach my handlers to do something i try and sort of pick something that you might know so 80s tunes are really cool so pick a sort of dancey but not too quick normally a michael jackson you can see my head going and that would be the pace that i would pick like a plod 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 and you've got to find a middle ground like a common ground for you for you and your team because obviously your spaniel's going to want to go quick and you want to slow it down it isn't going to happen overnight so you might have to be like, yeah, OK, we'll take off. I'll go quite quickly with you. Then we're going to start to slow down a little bit. And you want to do it so that you slow down your speed, but without interjecting any pressure on the um, harness. So you want your dogs to be pulling out in front, but you don't want any jerks or any accidental corrections. Does that make sense, Lisa Marie? So I basically put Michael Jackson in my head and I sing Michael Jackson and then my feet stay to the beat. And then that's how that's how I dictate the pace on my trails until I got into it, because otherwise I just get caught up in the moment and I can't remember a thing because I'm trying to not um, to not just get wrapped around the trees. Normally the one. 
Matthew said, I found doing more urban helped me control the speed. In urban and environment, you have to slow down and more control. Yeah, so in an urban, you're obviously controlling. Um, <laughs> Claire says she wants a Spaniel trailing playlist. <laughs> Yes, so in, <laughs> oh God, in yeah. urban you have to slow down purely because you can't allow the dog out uh, with a lot of line. Um, it's unsafe to do so. So you can't sort of fly off at a road. You can't fly around a corner because you don't know what's around there. You can't give your dog a lot of line um, because you don't know if it's going to go into the road with air scent and stuff <laughs> like that. So in urban, you probably would be a bit steadier. Um purely because you're risk assessing. But the only downside with that is you want it to be as fluid as you possibly can. And what I do see people doing is you often just get a load of line checks. Um, and if you look at a line check and look at how, I don't know how you look at training your dog, but if I was looking at training my dog, my dog would pull forward just for normal heel work, not outside of, not in man training. If my dog pulled forward, I would stop, ask it to come back. So if I accidentally check my line, then am I telling my dog stop, come back? Like it's almost like a conflict. Um, it's always like a conflict in the team. And for me, it's kind of, it's very much a team, a team sport. It's very much fluidity, I would say. I could actually say that and I've got my teeth in. Woo um yeah, it's trying to, to get you guys to, to be a, a team. So there's just no point in trying to match the pace of your Spaniel. You're not going to outrun it. You're not going to, it's not going to think straight. Slow it down. And the earlier you can slow it down, the better, because then that becomes part of the pattern. Rushing ahead doesn't become part of the pattern, because I think sometimes if you allow a Spaniel to do too much of a certain thing and it enjoys it, then that becomes part of the bigger problem. So if I allowed River to run on a trail, then I just think we'd swap really easily onto critters and then we'd be hunting. Like she'd just be like, she's sass. Like I, 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 some of the sessions I will trail her in front of you guys. So you can see the difference with my dogs. Um, I don't mind putting myself on the on the on the block because it could go horribly wrong. But um she's pure sass. She's like, yeah, I'll do it today. I'm not doing it tomorrow. And yeah, she's just, she's, she's got her head screwed on and it has to be what, what floats her boat. And if she doesn't get out of the right side of the bed, I think I'm, I'm done, <laughs> I'm done for. Um, but yeah, so definitely look at slowing down and don't shoot off. Um, Sita, yeah. I didn't really get it. If you mentioned tools to teach them how to get, go at a slower pace, could you mention a bit more on how? Um, I think I mentioned double lining. So ah. uh, double lining, your instructor would have um, another line. So you're not putting the pressure on the line. They're holding the weight or you're both holding the weight between you. I do this with very large dogs, so like Dobermans and Shepherds, where there is a physical um, weight issue. Um, but you can do it very fast. Spaniels, where it should have a line. You have a line. The instructor takes the weight where you focus on the dog and watching them and helping them where needed. But we physically teach them if you really really drag you're just not going to get anywhere why don't you walk a bit slower there is a lot of caveats to that there's a lot of issues with that if you're not fast if your instructor isn't quick enough to get the line out of the way you can check so it's not something i advise everybody to do um but i've used it before with spaniels in order to just teach them that they don't need to go at 90 mile an hour they've usually come from uh, doing it with themselves or with other instructors where the person has learned to run um and the dogs learned to run um with spaniels you can set trails up to make it harder for them in order to slow down so junctions uh, as matt said urban urban's a brilliant one for spaniels because they can't they have to really think about it because they've got to process the sense and you as a handler you will naturally slow right down um and not allowed to do stuff because you're more scared of them dying than not <laughs> um whereas out in the rural you're like oh the dog's really strong you know it's pulling me you might get a bit brambly um whereas at urban you're not going to let them get away from you you're not going to take the pee because you know that spaniel will throw itself under a car so you tend to suddenly get this you know kind of mother strength business going on um and also as tony just urban, sorry also with urban i think it's just a lot easier for the handler mm -hmm. other than a curb etc like the 
the environment doesn't change that much other than sort of turns corners the the, the the surface remains the same so it means that we can concentrate more on just trailing as opposed to oh i'm now going around a corner and there's a tree and i've got to go over a bramble and there's rooted yeah, yeah there's a big root there's a big hole like hole i've got to avoid this i've got to go up a hill so i think that's where urban makes it easier for the handler because there's a lot less like less for us to think about and then inevitably you've got no trees shrubs bushes to get your line stuck on um so that's always a big thing yeah and as tony said um so tony was a serial runner he was a runner with his spaniel man i couldn't keep up with him um and his spaniel was shit hot well his spaniel is shit hot and it's still shit hot um but we looked at changing the harness with him spaniels can be very front wheel drive and they pull forwards and they put all that pressure in front of them making them even stronger sometimes not all time a longer harness um like the judas canine bungee or the uh, nigelo and there's loads of fucking different brands out there can help slow a dog down because just with pressure on the flip side of that some spaniels do better on a short harness um because it's not touching in weird places and they're not really fighting against it so sometimes it's worth having a little bit of a look at the equipment um i don't know if you guys noticed on the slide actually the little spaniel that was in the photo the little cockle spaniel that was got its head down like that little black one he had a bungee on the harness to the line and that takes the pressure off and what happens the dog isn't like fighting the tension because the bungee just releases gently it just bounces in and out whereas the line is very you know it's very stuck and some dogs are like get off me and they pull against that extreme tension again that's knowing your dog and also speaking to your instructor and if they've got a kit bag or borrowing someone's harness or trying a different line sometimes a little tweak in how the equipment is or how you perceive the equipment to be can affect that speed a little bit and help them slow down help that dog work differently i know jolene's been through about 18 billion harnesses um and another one of our instructors got a really large springer and she just cannot find the right harness for that dog because it, it's what suits the shape um and so it is a bit of a trial and error jobby, but it's always worth going, oh, what's that one? <laughs> Can I try that harness? And you immediately buy the really expensive one from Europe and it doesn't fit. Um, we've all been yeah. there. Um, Chantel's asked about the bungee. The bungees are little from pet shops. They're like little micro, they're about a metre long, maybe a foot long. And they've got a clip each end. I've, I've only seen them occasionally in pet shops. They're just, I think they're bungee shopping stores for dog leads. Um, not something I recommend as standard, but some dogs it works no. with. Other dogs it creates a ping back effect, um, and you get if you do jud it, it goes ping, and it and it will slap the dogs back. So you need it, again. This is where you should be speaking to a instructor about borrowing stuff and trying stuff rather than going out and buying stuff and using it straight away. If you're on any of our workshops, we always carry ten thousand bits of gear, um, so it's always a good chance to have a little bit of a look. And because we work with so many spaniels and their crosses we can usually look at a dog and go, I think that harness will do. It's a very sad skill we have now. Um, much like I play the game of, I can hear a bark, what breed is that? And I'm usually pretty accurate. Um, it's There's different things, but a lot of it is don't suddenly change five things and hope the dog will stop pulling. You're going to create problems. Um, it's little suggestions of maybes, but I would always work with an instructor or an experienced team to try and can kind of see if that's going to make a difference or not and i'm going to throw one in here um and i'm probably going to be absolutely hated by every handler on here also like don't get a bungee if you're just being lazy learn to do your line like the bungee is awesome because it will stop those accidental jerks but hey are you actually fixing anything no you're just putting something else to try and help the problem is it going to be better? We don't know until we try it. So, hey, I might as well go out the back, hang my line up and practice going up and down my line at different speeds or taking the dog out for a walk with its long line on and practice keeping the long line off the floor is an awesome one to try. Um, don't slack off in, on your part of the team. Like I see it all the time. And even if you can't trail, like you need your line handling to be muscle memory or even so it's just sunk in your brain as to what you do. Like sometimes the Spaniel and River, like as well, I've tried all the ones with the bungees. I've tried long harnesses, I've tried short harnesses. Um, and I literally just need to give her like five centimeters of line and she's happy. 
but I need to give a five centimeters of line without jerks. And I'm not perfect at it. We've hopefully we'll load a video in a bit to show you how easy it is and what we're talking about. But it's don't skip out on your line handling part. Make sure that it's muscle memory. Practice at home as much as you can, and then at least you're putting in your part of the deal with your with your man training team. Does that make sense? The other thing about if we'll just quickly do slow down a bit more is like as a handler and me and I'm doing a single blind like if my dog's going so quick and somebody then goes oh, okay you've shot off where was it last trailing well because my dogs are so quick I'm probably 50 to 100 meters away and still perceive them to be trailing so it's really hard to do your recovery plan so if you start sort of setting a better pace you'll notice a bit more, the dog will be able to think a bit better and you'll be able to go, oh, actually I had a change in behavior at that junction just back there. I'm gonna just take it back to that junction back there as opposed to flying past it and then being 50 meters down the way and not knowing where the dog had it last. All right. Absolutely, I'm just hunting for that video because it won't play on the thing now. <laughs> I embedded. <laughs> I never heard that. Dogs have just suddenly been letting limber room and I heard them hit the door and go, <gasps> she's in there. <laughs> that was creepy as sod. Um, right. Um, have a look at we've, starting. We've, a little bit of our trail was. Well, I think we've, we've covered it, to be honest. Have we not? Have we? Is there anything? Yeah, I think yeah, so, maybe. Was the change in the ritual, but. Oh, I'm just slightly conscious of time. It's half past eight. Um, yeah. The only thing I'd say is like, just something that I'd want to sort of make you aware of, and we talk about it all the time, is your spaniel's ready to trail from the moment you make your pots at home. So when people are coming up to the scent article and, and they don't believe that their spaniel's trailing, you'll often find a spaniel's trailing from the car park. And that's purely because they now have got into the perceived thing that I'm going to do this activity and they're excited from you making the pots so they're ready before they've even got into the car and they're already switched on so as the uh, so the more you can do in terms of sort of benefiting your your team getting your kit ready having your pots ready making sure um the trail layer's got the pots and it's sort of able to sort of deliver the reward the way you want to prepping prior to getting your spaniel out the car unless you're doing intensity and delayed starts then that is setting your dog up for success you also know the game now so you know what, what's going to happen yourself so you know that you're coming up to an area to start a trail with a scent article don't sort of aimlessly wander over and be sort of told where to go or to what to do if you see the scent article on the floor come straight in, put your kit down, do your scent inventory round, your ritual, whatever you choose to call it, but you wanna be doing that scent, scent inventory straight away. There shouldn't be any delay, especially with the people that have been doing it for quite a while. You know what's going to happen. So come straight in, pop your kit down, straight into that scent inventory. So there's no faff, there's no way that your dog can get frustrated. Because what happens is we're just getting a driven dog that's ready to play. And then we're adding loads of other complexities because we're not ready. So then before we've even started, the dog's frustrated. Would you agree with that one? Absolutely. I would 100% agree with that. Um, and it's the biggest thing that some Spaniel people come up with. The dog's not taken scent from the scent article. The Spaniel knows. The Spaniel smelt it 15 minutes ago with a piss out of the back of the car when they saw you had the pots to the trail layer. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't underestimate what they're already working on before you task them to trail. Because remember, you're not in charge, the dog is. <laughs> and also um, don't get too close to the scent article like everyone does it all the time like those dogs like I said are trailing from the car park they don't need to get so close to the scent article so make sure you do a nice big scent inventory round and I've been telling clients where they can is sort of stay 10 meters away from your scent article uh, if you need a hand to look at distances and judge distance where you can and where it's physically possible you want to be staying as far away as possible like 10 meters up to 10 meters away from it so your dog doesn't get that accidental sniff because what's happening is when we then do ask them to take scent they're like i don't want to i've already got it and if we can get the video to load you'll see i've got it's it's, it's starting uh, but it's mm -hmm. taking a sweet time about so 
Um, at the moment, we've only got like four seconds of it, so we're going to need to let it load a little bit more. Um, what I'm probably going to do is do that in the background, and we'll just talk about spaniel days and bits and bobs, and then hopefully yeah. get the video loaded in the background. Sorry, I live in the middle of nowhere in Wales, guys. Internet is a little bit poor. I posted a page that upgraded the other day. It hasn't happened yet. Um, so we'll just jump a little bit ahead and we'll come back to the video because it is a really good video. And if we can't get it to load, what we'll do is get Jolene to do a little um, voiceover on it and I'll add it onto the end of this video um, with some magic when I pay someone else to do it. But I'm just going to screen share back onto the bit. The things I talk about are stuff that I'm really passionate about because it's often stuff that I'm going through myself. Like I said at the start of the video, it's like I'm not infallible because I'm an instructor. Um, my dogs aren't super hot. They're not robots. They're not coming out of the car like super primed and don't get distracted. Like if anything, I come away going, oh God, I'm giving it up. I'm done sometimes. And do you know what? I just have to go today. It's just not our day. Um, my, as long as my dogs enjoy it, like that's all that matters. But I try and put as much effort into me being as prepared as I possibly can to just limit the frustration for my dogs um but yeah I'm not infallible if you see me trail like sometimes we're an amazing team and we float almost and then other days it's just like an absolute car crash um if I get caught up in something or but that's what we're hoping to do on these training days that we're going to be looking at doing uh we're just doing going to be doing a few more spaniel specific training days coming up um we'll share the details in a second um, but we want to be able to help you guys sort of be more of a team and and sort of glide almost would be the word. Like you just want to be more successful and sort of make it as easy as you possibly can for your Spaniel to succeed. And that sometimes starts with you too. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at doing. So if you want to find us, uh, that's me on the top. Um, you can get into the camera and jiggy um yeah we we are super social guys so just drop us a message anytime ask questions send us a video and uh, we'll always get back to you as soon as um but if you ask a question the first thing i'm going to say is have you got a video of it so send the video then ask a question <laughs> it's a lot easier um we're now going to jump on to our spaniel days our much anticipated spaniel day um webinar uh, in-person days that we're running at the end of this year and beginning of next year um i'm going to pop the link in the chat in a minute of where you can get these um if you have already booked a spaniel day with us please give everybody 24 hours to book on before you book yours just because we'd like to give everybody the chance to come and trail with spaniels with us um we understand you're keen and i absolutely love it but we want lots of different people to be able to help. We'd, we'd like to be able to help lots of different Spaniel owners rather. Um, and it's nice to meet different people. Um, so anything that's in bold is on Jolene's booking system. And anything that's italics is on my booking system. Um, I'm going to pop the links in the chat in a minute. Um, oh, Jolene, you can do that while I'm twittering along. Um, so the 13th of October is Air Scenting Spaniels. We're working um, at a paintball park. That's waiting list only. That's on Jolene's system. Please go and put your emails in the waiting list. Um, we always get one or two people drop out of these things just because that's the way life is when you're working with 10 teams. Um, so if you're on the waiting list, you will get an automatic email as soon as someone cancels. So you can get first dibs on it. If you're not on the waiting list, I don't know you want to be there. And do not message us going, can I go on the waiting list? I will instantly forget um 28th of october it's kind of chase it's gonna be nice and windy um and full of critters that's gonna be a fun one um 10th of december we're doing the christmas crittering cat christmas special at kidderminster um this is going to be on a huge um woodlands arboretum type area um and that does include a christmas lunch uh christmas bap with us um it's not going to be Christmas theme. We're not going to do theme stuff, but it just be nice of a Christmas special and a bit of socialisation. Um, Wellington by Telford is newbie spaniels. You, if you do have more experience, experience spaniel, it's absolutely fine. We will tailor the trails to you. But we're aiming for those that haven't trailed with us before and would like to really get like nitty gritty of their spaniels. 
Um, it's a really cool um, site where we've got access to urban and rural and it's the wind's a little bit funny so it's quite a good cool place to trail. 14th of January after Christmas will be Shrewsbury Urban Spaniel. This is for experienced spaniels and handlers only because we were literally going to trail for the middle of Shrewsbury. It is like nitty gritty little alleys. It's such good fun and it will make you sweat as a handler. Um, but I love trailing through Shrewsbury Town Centre. Um, and we test how dog friendly they say their shopping centres are. And every time security is so good with us. <laughs> And they just see us whizzing around like idiots. Um, but it's really good fun. But that is really for experienced families. If you have been, if you've not been trailing for, I would say at least four to six months, if you've not got like a good 10 to 15 sessions under your belt, um, you might potentially really, really damage your relationship with your dog because it is hard trails. And what we don't want you to do is is set up a trail that the dog's not ready for and it, it fail and then we can't fix it on a day and you go home and cry and whatever else like we don't want it what we want is you to have lots of really good experiences um don't be put off by it being experienced if you know that coming january you're gonna do lots of trailing between now and then then absolutely book it but if you come up to the date and you think oh shit i haven't done much trailing as i want please speak to us um so we can speak to your instructor just to make sure because we don't want things to go wrong um on these these days um, we want lots and lots of fun and excitement. Um, Jolene, have you managed to put the links in the thing? Yeah, I've put them up, but I'm just double checking. Nice one. Uh, make sure I've got them right. Is everyone seeing it? So I don't know if people want to take a screenshot of this screen. Um, you can then go, but anything in bold is on Jolene's system, anything in italics of my system. Um, if all the Spaniel stuff takes off and we become the Spaniel queens of man trailing, it might be a bit more streamlined into one booking system. But right now you've got to put up with us doing it a separate systems. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it's such as life. Um, but yeah, definitely. If you've already booked the 13th of, 10th, 13th of October, 10th of December, those ones i'm oh, sorry the 28th of october so the first two dates if you've already booked those please give everybody else a little bit of a chance to book first and then you could do it 24 hours it's not because we don't want you there we'd love to have you there but we'd like to meet some other spaniel people as well please um we'd like we'd like more spaniel addicts <laughs> with what we do um super i'm just gonna take that off and like we said we want it to be like a, a community like we all help each other um, out and sort of have um, a chat about things so it's really open um, because inevitably we're still learning like we just because we're instructors doesn't mean we know everything like we might have a little bit more trailing experience or we might trail a few more dogs but nobody knows anything and if they're telling you that they're lying um, but yeah so oh, yeah. you guys are really helping us out too so and we're super super grateful like those two first events sort of sold out like super quick and we're super super grateful but also we know that there's a need there for this um because that's what we're being shown that there's a need there and equally if you've got an instructor that's by you um and you want to try and get us up there we could be looking at being hosted um and so we'll we'll come, a spaniel tour, like, yeah we will let's travel take the spaniel possible. stuff on the road um but yes yeah, so if you've got an instructor you work with and you, they've got loads of spaniels or etc then we're happy to come up and put on um some spaniel stuff and we're not only doing sort of body language each day is going to be looking at something different so like we said um the last one we did we looked at what the dogs were actually searching for and broke it down um and then like we're doing one on crittering and junctions, we're doing like um, air scent and how the scent's gonna move and stuff. So it isn't just a, oh, let's just go and trail with some more instructors. It's we're hoping to provide a bit more of a package, a bit more of an insight as to what's happening. Um, but yeah, we're super, super thrilled that it's just become so popular. And we hope that we get to do more of these webinars. And again, feedback, like feedback to us about, was it good? Did you learn something? Um, what would you like us to talk about? What would you like us to do? Like we're always really open and we'll try and do our best um, to just get the information out there to people. 
yeah and it's we enjoy it you know i love we love talking about spaniels man trailing um it's a small addiction we have and um it's it's fun because we genuinely see like last workshop it was so nice to see people just like click and go yeah that makes loads of sense and it's it's not because they didn't already know it's because it just hadn't been presented in the right way or they hadn't quite you know hadn't spoke to the right person but what was also nice with lots of spaniel people speaking to each other they would never have met that came from all over the country and i know that some of them still chat about spaniels and stuff so it's a nice community um but yeah if you've got any questions now then start throwing them at us in the chat or just unmute yourself um and if you've got anything afterwards please just email one of us both of us whatever you want um pigeon mail whatever get in touch with us corner us our workshop um and any suggestions for webinars would be greatly appreciated because we want to tailor it to you guys we want to give you any what questions? you guys need um and more um we want to give you like elements of trailing that you possibly might be missing not because like somebody doesn't know it to teach you but just somebody might not have spotted it like um it's just the spaniels are quite hard to read sometimes so the more information we can give you as teams the more the stronger teams you'll be um and the more your dog's going to benefit from it and at the end of the day it's got to be for the dogs like it's got to be 100 percent for the dogs we're not going to go sit on canic chase in october for shits and giggles, it's for the dogs. <laughs> At least there won't be any <laughs> adders. No, there won't be any adders. It might be an instructor in a heap in the corner um, who's tripped over something. Yeah, um, that'll be me then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you also get the opportunity to see our dogs trail. If you, if you guys on workshops want to, we'll get there early and we'll, we'll set up some trails for our dogs and you'll get to see how we do it. And um, I'll preface that with do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> yeah it's really hard when you put yourself out there and it's like a big thing because like it could go completely wrong like we're not perfect like i said we're not infallible i could get my dog out of the car and she might go completely in the wrong direction after a rabbit like who knows it's like um, okay we set that rabbit up learning guys did you did, we needed you to see yeah. what would happen we, we, we i placed that rabbit half an hour ago and it's really well trained <laughs> So yeah, so it, but I think it'd be really cool for you to watch. Obviously, it's going to be subject, subjective to make sure that the dogs, we're going to have to do some testing to make sure that the dogs are comfortable with like a group of people watching them. Um, and what we're hoping to do is that one of us will trail and the other person will talk over the top with the group and explain what's happening. Um, so Brian's just said, thanks for the webinar, very interested. Still a bit confused about the difference between crittering and hunting. So crittering is where we're looking at the dog switching scent. So it's switched from human to possibly animal or human to human sometime. Or if you've got a foodie dog, like River is like, could be switching from human to Greg's sausage roll. So that's like what we say by crittering. So it's the distraction that then pulls the dog off, but it's following the distraction scent. When we're looking at hunting, we're potentially looking at the dog has lost the human trail, but is looking to find it again. And that's the difference with the Spaniels is that they're quite often quickly go into hunt. So it can be look quite the same. So we're looking at the dogs lost the trail, but it's hunting to try and find it. Does that make better sense, Brian, if you can let me know? Uh, Matthew said something really reassuring to see and instruct to have exactly the same issues that you do yeah we all do like I'm not gonna lie like I'm not gonna pretend I'm something I'm not um it's uh it's all we all work with dogs I don't get up every day feeling exactly the same ready to go and my dogs definitely don't so um but like line handling and everything is um is something that we all need to learn so that's what we want to do is look at giving you the tips to get you better so that then that, oh, look, it's the Malinois. So then that then helps you as a team. Oh, thanks, Brian. If there's still any questions, Brian, drop me a message, but we're probably looking at what people have said, we might do some videos of stuff and see if we can comment over the top so that you can see possibly either the change because it's hard, it's gonna be hard to see the change, but 
when you're going from crittering to hunting, etc., because it's going to be subjected to the dog's body language. Um, but when you're looking at sort of um, negatives, blown scent, uh, proximity alert, we can probably do a few bits and pieces with that. But again, it's going to be body language subjected to that dog that's being videoed, if that makes sense. Like we can probably do something else talking about body language and stuff like that and what to find and what to look for. We often do a lot of that when we're trailing anyway. Um, but the, the body language itself is going to be subjective to that team. So it's working with somebody who can kind of know um, what to look out for and, and have a look. Yeah, so yeah, yeah we'll try I think video videos. Um, is a really good suggestion because then we can just give our two pence on what's going on and when it's not going to be 100% perfect but at least it gives you guys a bit more of a visual which unfortunately with zoom it just slows the videos right down like I can't even load the video right now because my internet's shit so, um, so the video, I'll quickly explain it because it's that puppy is mental I'll quickly explain the video um, because I wanted to show that it wasn't infallible. So it was a video of me setting my dog River up on an intensity start. So we were doing some filming to show an intensity start. Um, we've actually got two different opinions on it, which is quite cool. Um, but looking back at the video, so I set do my scent inventory round, the dogs wound up, the trail layer goes, the dogs turned round so it doesn't see the trail layer. And then the moment I take her back, she's gone to take scent quickly and I accidentally line checked her because I wasn't ready and then I've then tried to get her in to take scent and then she's then gone I don't want to do that I've done it silly so it was just to show sort of how different it can be um, um, for each trial but how easy it can be done 